My name is Erin Edgerton with Dania International, and thank you so much for joining us for today's Google Hangout. Today we're talking about engaging women using social media and really engaging them on public health and health topics. To discuss this, I have a really phenomenal group of panelists, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves in just a second. We are really happy to be participating uh, with this event in Social Media Week, which is a worldwide event happening this week. Um, and so we encourage you to take a look and see what else is happening this week to celebrate and really move social media forward as a field. So I'm going to hand it over to my panelists. I'm going to introduce them and let them tell you a little bit about themselves. Uh, Rebecca Aguilar, let's start with you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Rebecca Aguilar. I am a reporter. I've been a reporter for 33 years, 27 years in television news. I'm also the vice president of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. I do all their social media, Twitter, Facebook. And I'm also the founder of Wise Latinas Linked. It is a social networking group on Facebook, the largest Latina group on Facebook and LinkedIn. Thank you for joining us today. Great, thank you so much. Barbara Fakara, I'm going to hand it over. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Barbara, I think you may be on mute. Yes, I am. Apologies for that. <laughs> <laughs> I am so honored to be here. Thank you for having me. My name is Barbara Fakara. I am a registered nurse. I have a master's degree in public administration with a specialty in health administration. I work as a nurse in a level two trauma center. I began my media career in radio as the executive producer and host of the Health in 30 radio show, the former Health in 30 radio show. A new show is actually under development. The website healthin30.com is has began as an extension to that. I focus on patient empowerment, and the main focus is to empower patients and consumers to take charge of their health. I write about healthy living, healthy, uh, all different health topics, healthcare, social media, health IT, gamification, health apps. Um, I am actually on the ed health, the editorial advisory board for ShareCare, and I'm one of their health educators there health educators, and I actually write for the Huffington Post. Great. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thanks. Dr. Sandra Ford, I'd like to hand it over. Please introduce yourself. Hi there. I am Dr. Sandra Elizabeth Ford. I'm the District Health Director for DeKalb County, which is a um, suburb of Atlanta, Georgia, about 730,000 people. I'm responsible for all public health issues in that area, which would include everything from restaurants to hotel inspections, um, infectious disease outbreaks, environmental health, bioterrorism, very busy job, but um, also very fun. Uh, prior to that, I was a pediatrician, and so uh, my focus at that time was adolescent health. Glad to be here today. Thank you for joining us. Michelle Late, we're very pleased that you're here. Please tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Michelle Late. I'm executive editor of the Nation's Health newspaper here at the American Public Health Association. I'm also part of a social media team here for the organization. Uh, most notably, I'm administrator of App Public Health Twitter account, which has more than a quarter of a million followers. Great, thank you. Uh, Patricia Redsicker, please introduce yourself. Hi there, my name is Patricia Redsicker. I am a healthcare writer and also a social media consultant. And what I do primarily is to work with healthcare brands, helping them to develop content as well as to help them create uh, social media strategies that will help promote their businesses and get in front of their target audiences. I write for several publications, including Social Media Examiner. I do quite a bit of uh, research in um, social, social media research uh, across all industries. And uh, thank you for having me. Great. Thank you so much for being here. We're also going to be joined today by Pam Moore. Um, she's just coming online now, so as soon as she, she joins us, I'll have her introduce herself as well. So. Um, we uh, are really interested to have this discussion. We've collected some questions ahead of time, but we really appreciate um, uh, folks to get involved, ask questions throughout. So you can participate on Twitter by using the hashtag W, the number four, 
PH. You can also submit questions through the Google event page, um, and we'll be watching for those throughout the discussion. Um, and I am pleased to say that Pam has joined us. Hello, Pam. And I'd like to hand it over and see if you would like to uh, take a minute and introduce yourself. Oh, I'm not sure that we can hear okay, you. Okay, can you hear me now? Oh, yes. Okay. It's like All that right, now we have commercial. a full house. I'll hand yes. it over to you, Pam. Sorry, I had a few technical difficulties this morning. Everything worked perfect for the dry run yesterday. <laughs> so I am Pam Moore, Pam Marketing Nut Online, as what everybody knows me as. But I am the CEO and founder of Marketing Nuts, and we're a full-service social business uh, digital marketing agency. But I've worked in tech and in corporate brand marketing for 15-plus uh, years, and so we left corporate a few years ago and founded our agency and really are just truly having a blast. Some days I think we, they call this work, but we're helping organizations of all sizes from entrepreneurs up to Fortune 50 brands really just bridge the divide you know, with technology and, and impacting people's lives and businesses. So I'm, I'm happy to be here today. Thank you. Uh, I'm really pleased we have such a great group of people for this discussion today. Um, as I mentioned, we're talking about using social media to engage women in health issues. Uh, and so to open it up, I'd like to start by asking um, the panelists, why is it that we want to use social media um, to engage women? Why is it important? And specifically, what challenges are there? Um, so uh, Patricia, we'd like to start with you. Um, give us your thoughts on using social media to engage women. Well, first of all, everybody's on social media, men, women, teenagers, every demographic that you want to reach is on social media. And I think um, that is uh, a no-brainer in this digital age that we're in that we want to get uh, in front of people in a friendly environment, in a place where they're already hanging out. So social media is definitely the default uh, space. Uh, with women in particular, <coughs> excuse me, one of the challenges that I see uh, for women uh, looking for, for healthcare information online is the idea that um, women tend to be, they want trustworthy information, they want resources that are credible. Being that they're the caregivers of the family, and they're the primary decision makers for all things healthcare when it comes to their households, they want to be sure that the information they receive is credible and trustworthy. And I think that um, uh, women tend to trust the people they're closest to, their families, their friends, those very trusted colleagues at work. And so social media cannot be just a faceless organization trying to reach women. There has to be a way where, a way how, where you can connect them and their networks, their personal networks, and get them having these conversations with their peers whom they trust because, you know, that trust factor is extremely important. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Ford, I know that reaching women, and particularly with credible and trustworthy information, as Patricia said, is something that's really important to you all. So could you add on to that and share your thoughts about using social media to reach women? Well, sure. First of all, we all know knowledge is power, so anything that gets the word out is important to us. Um, in public health, that's a lot of what we spend our time doing, is educating the public on risks and things that they can do to improve their health and extend their life. Uh, my concern and one of the challenges I see, um, as stated before, is the accuracy of the information. Um, a lot of websites may claim that they have a medical background and they may not. Um, some of these are just one person's opinion. I worry about blogs specifically. Um, a lot of drugs are tested on a pretty broad population, so just because one person has a bad experience does not necessarily mean that drug is bad or that immunization or that treatment. And so I worry that um, a lot of times people, depending on how passionately they express their opinion, could really be um, dangerous to someone who didn't have any other ways of, of checking information. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, we know that APHA is very interested in using social media, but also as a large organization has to be very careful about sharing accurate information. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about your perspective on using social media to reach women with credible information? 
Well, first of all, I do think that it's really important to provide health information to women because women are more likely to make the health decisions for their family and they're more likely to go online for health information than men. And they do face some of the same challenges on social media as they do on other parts of the internet. As the fellow panelists said, find incredible information. But with social media, there's also the risk that rumors and information could spread really, really quickly. And when it comes to health, um, spreading this information actually, you know, has health implications as well. So I think, you know, you always want to use credible sources. You always want to check things before you retweet and repost. But with health, that's even more crucial. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, we know that you work particularly with the um, Hispanic and Latino audiences. Do you see any um, unique challenges or opportunities in using um, social media to reach women? Well, let me address social media uh, first of all. One of the things with women as a whole, before I get into Latinas, one of the things with women is we're hungry for our information, we want it now, and we love to talk. Those are three key things that we have that men don't. Men don't share like we do. They're not going to talk about, you know, getting, you know, doing our self mamma, you know, uh, breast exams or those kind of things. So that's the great thing about women. We want immediate information. We want it accurate. We want to share, and we want to talk about it. That's the great thing about social media. Talking about some of the things that the panelists said that were challenges is you're all right. We need accurate information. We need to do the research on who's giving us that information. Is it someone being paid by a medical company to say great things? You have to do your research. I approach everything, and as you know, I'm a journalist by profession. I do my research on everybody. If someone's blogging about it, I want to see, okay, well, wait a minute. Do they have a medical background? Or was she a stay-at-home mother last year? And suddenly, medicine is her expertise. You have to do your research. When it concerns Latinas, what we're looking for are things that affect Latinas. Ovarian cancer is high. Cervical cancer is high. Heart disease is high. We want to see the studies that are being done on Latinos. The challenging thing also is there are a lot of Latinos who are not on the Internet, but they are on their smartphones. So we, make, we have to make sure it's, it's that whole mobile app. Also, bilingual. I'm fluent in Spanish. I have to translate things for my mother who's 85 years old, not on the internet, and doesn't really read English. So those are the challenges we face, and I think that many people who have addressed the Latino audience, they know the challenges, and fortunately, they're working on it. Thank you. You've raised several really good points about social media and the differences in communicating with women in particular. So the next question for the panel is, is social media well suited for women? Is it better for communicating um, with women than it is with men? Um, so Pam, I'd like to hand it over to you to hear a little bit about why it's well suited uh, for outreach to women. Oh, Pam, you might be having a little bit of a difficulty with your sound. And, and I'm muting my help. Is that better? Yes, you're oh, back. Sorry. That was me, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I think both, you know, I think social is great for both men and women. And I, I'm honestly seeing a, a trend toward even, you know, and maybe it's just my circle of friends, but even the men in my life sharing even health information about women. But um, to answer, and w information that can help women. But to answer your question, how is social suited for women? You know, as mentioned earlier, women share what they learn. They share what they think. They, sh they share real time what they are absorbing into their brain and into their heart and mind. And so I think there's such an importance for um, brands in the private and public sector to become part of that conversation. You know, and I know we're going to talk a lot about that today, but you have to be part of their mind and part of their thinking. And it can't just be an annual campaign to get them to remember. You know, it takes six to seven brand touches for somebody to remember you exist, right, or to remember that message. And so it needs to be a continual message that is educating, inspiring, and um, personal with them. But I think, you know, once that happens, it's like, you know, a fire that's just going to be, uh, you, you know, ignited that, um, that that information is going to spread in, in such an organic, natural way. 
Great. This sounds a lot about, Barbara, what you have talked about writing about, and so I wanted to give you the opportunity to, to add on to the conversation here and talk about social media and its potential to reach women. And I think we're having a little bit of trouble with your sound as well. Yes, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, it, it's such a really an exciting time in healthcare today because communication is changing. It's real-time communication. Everyone's collaborating in the social platforms, whether it's Twitter or Facebook. So there's an engagement, collaboration, communication all happening at the same exact time. Um, social media for women um, is definitely prevalent within the healthcare within the platforms of social media. Um, Pew Internet and American Life Project. For, uh, according to, to that source, 85% um, of adults are using uh, the internet and 72% of those online adult users are searching for information online and 79% are female and 65% are male. So, so there's no question, adults, male, female, female are definitely searching online for health information and it's great for healthcare professionals to be involved in social media as well because they can tap into the patient or consumer and educate them on health topics. So that's a really powerful tool that we have. Um, a lot of hospitals are actually actively engaging in social media today too. Um, Ed Bennett created a, a whole list of all the hospitals around the country mm -hmm. using social media um, and it's, it, it could be found in the Mayo Clinic. But I think there's about over a thousand hospitals now in, engaging in social media. So it's truly a powerful tool to educate the public and raise awareness of health issues um, and, and to collaborate back and forth in real time. So I think it's just a, a powerful way to, to really tap into what's on the minds of women and men today. Thank you. I think you raised I think you might need to repeat the question. Yes, I yes, I do need to repeat the question. <laughs> um, so, as public health communicators, um, we know that we uh, are pushing out a lot of information, and there are campaigns or initiatives that are particularly important to us. Um, but uh, we uh, heard a good point from Barbara in terms of joining the ongoing conversation as it's happening. Uh, and so, um, I'd like to talk about how we, as public health communicators, can participate more in those ongoing conversations instead of just always pushing out information. Uh, so Rebecca, I'd like to hand it over to you first and hear some of your thoughts on that. Well, I think um, as a journalist, we want to hear from the public health communicators. We want to hear about credible ones. Because right now the problem is, as journalists, and I know that I get more than 100 emails a day, we want to know who's credible who, again, as I said, there are a gazillion bloggers out there talking about health, talking about this and that. Our problem as journalists, and also as journalist bloggers, is we're trying to figure out, okay, who's credible and who isn't? Who's being paid by a company and who isn't? And that's our biggest challenge. I'm not a public health communicator. I'm a journalist. So you guys are the ones that are feeding me. But, when, for example, if, if Barbara was sending me something, <clears throat> excuse me, of course I do my background check on her. And obviously, she's got the credentials. It's coming from her. It means something. And then I will be able to disseminate it in a TV um, story or maybe a radio story, a podcast, a blog. That's the, the challenge that we as journalists face. Who is credible and who is not? Who's getting paid by a company, a medical company, and who is not? So I think that especially many of, of uh, our audience, if you are a blogger, make sure you, you show your credentials. Make sure that if you know you have a degree in medicine or um, anything that shows your expertise, someone like me that's a journalist, we're going to chew on that. 
we're going to give you more credibility than no disrespect for bloggers who were, you know, stay-at-home moms last year. Uh, but that's important to us. So I'm looking at it from the other side. And that's a great perspective. Thank you. Um, Dr. Ford, I'd like to hand it over to you and hear your thoughts on joining in conversations um, as opposed to pushing out information, depending on, you know, whatever the recent uh, campaign or initiative is. Oh. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Got me? So, we, we love an audience in public health. I think that's when we do our best work is when we have a crowd that's open to hearing um, important information. That's a lot of what we do is just disseminate things that are important. Um, where women are concerned, particularly, I'm going to speak from my mom perspective, uh, my parents, moms just want to be good mothers and so they really want any information that helps them raise their child to be healthier, to be better nourished, to avoid chronic diseases, um, to to be successful adults and so we are lucky because for the most part we probably have a pretty um, open audience for most of the information that we want to share. Fantastic. So there are ongoing conversations that women are having in, in public health and online. We've just discussed that. Are there things that they aren't discussing that uh, we hope that they would or that issues that we're trying to engage them in? Uh, and uh, I'd like to hand it back to Barbara to see is there are there things that are missing that uh, we should be encouraging conversation around? Um, sure. Um, I, I will actually uh, cite the Pew Internet and American Life Project again. Um, it's actually a wonderful website that has a lot of statistics, but they estimate that 7% um, only um, of people online are talking about uh, end-of-life decisions. Um, and that's a really critical topic, and it's a very difficult topic, um, especially working in the hospital, dealing with patients and families. Um, it, it, it's just just such a difficult topic, and then personally as well, dealing with that topic. But um, So not many people are talking about it. It's a vital topic that I think the conversation needs to head in a direction to enlighten patients and their families before they make that decision, before they're in the hospital talking with the doctor doctors and nurses, they, they need to have information prior to that because once you're in the hospital dealing with that, it's just so totally different um, and a lot of emotions take over. So that's a really critical topic that um, is not getting a lot of attention. Um, and this is, again, for uh, per America, uh, Pew Internet and American Life Project. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one of the topics that they're really not talking too much about. Thank but you. critical. <laughs> We know that there's a lot going on in social media. Uh, some of it are the conversations we want, some are the gaps that we've just heard about, topics that could deserve a little bit more attention. There's a lot of noise, too. Our public health messages are competing with a lot of information from private sector, from brands, um, from a lot of different sources. And so my next question is, how do we get health information to really stand out? How can we rise that to the top um, and make that something that people want to have a conversation about? Uh, and I'm going to start, uh, hand it over to Pam and see your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think number one, it's just connecting really in a real way with your audience and, and knowing, you know, instead of trying to blast messages to everybody that could possibly hear it when you have a campaign, it's, it's really targeting that audience and saying, okay, I want to reach this demographic of women between this age, you know, and it may even have geography demographics their income demographics, but just fine tune that message as much as you possibly can and make it as relevant as possible to that audience. And you know, that's truly the way you're going to stand out. And then because that right audience is going to hear, because as you said, there's just so much noise, right? There's so much noise. And so 
we're grabbing bits and pieces of information that are, are relevant to us. And then second, you know, okay, how do you stand out among the relevant ways, uh, of the relevant content that's out there? It's It's got to be fresh. It's got to be inspiring. It's got to be simple, as others have talked about. But it's got to truly just be understandable. You know, it's got to be something that grabs me and that is going to inspire me to take an action. Because, you know, content is only as good um, as, as somebody is willing to take an action to read it, to digest digest it to share it with somebody that they know right and there there there's the factors i just talked about that are going to inspire them to take that action so with every piece of information that you put out there know your audience and know what you want them to do with it right so if they read you want them to read it uh, who do you want to read it what action do you want them to take with that you know, and, and that better be clear before you start blasting out any type of campaign information. I think that's probably the most critical aspect. Patricia, I see you uh, nodding your head as well. Would you like to, to add in with your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think the only other thing, I mean, Pam has pretty much, uh, you know, uh, laid out uh, the, whole, the whole deal with that. Uh, and I think I can add that, you know, if you want, if you're going to be on social media, you really want to be interesting. Um, I think the same uh, Pew research that Barbara had quoted earlier has uh, said previously that education and entertainment are the topmost reasons why people go on the internet, social media especially. So as a brand, you have to be more interesting, really, than the people that I'm actually hanging out with on Facebook. <laughs> if you're going to get my attention, otherwise I'll hide your posts. If, if what you're saying to me isn't interesting, I won't listen to you because you, you are not interesting enough. And so every brand is competing not just against another brand that does what it does. If you're a healthcare communicator, you're not just competing against other healthcare communicators. You're also co competing against um, artists and politicians and my friends and my kids on social media. You're competing against everybody who I'm interacting with online. And that is a huge challenge. And so the way for you and I as communicators to be seen, to rise above, above that noise, as Pam uh, put it so, so very well, was to be helpful. Simply be helpful. Know what people want and give it to them. Forget about yourself. Forget about your brand. And you know what? As you help people, you win over their trust. You win over their loyalty. And eventually, they'll buy from you. But be interesting because boring is the kiss of death. Really. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. I'd actually like to hand it over now to uh, Michelle to hear some from APHA. Being interesting, being fresh uh, is sometimes hard for a large organization. And so I know that APHA does a really great job in engaging people with their social media. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on how you can make an organization's message stand out. Well, one way is is going where your audience is. That's just not, I mean, using the social media accounts that they use, but also joining the conversation that's already going on out there, even if it's not directly related to the conversation that you want to have. Um, for example, the American Public Health Association uh, raised awareness of vaccination this year by sending a tweet out after the royal birth. Um, we sent out a tweet during the Super Bowl raising awareness of being prepared for a power outage. If you were watching the Emmys this weekend, the AARP was really active um, tweeting during the Emmys. And, you know, it was a great way to engage an audience that wasn't coming to them and who may not be following them because they were part of the conversation that was already out there. Thank you. Um, so a lot of organizations have large public health campaigns and it is their job to get the message out, raise awareness, get people to take action, be healthier or safer. Uh, and so um, I'd like to talk about uh, what pieces of uh, social media make a campaign effective. How do you use social media effectively in a campaign? Uh, and so I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Ford um, and hear from you on that. 
Well, we've actually done some award-winning pieces um, through social media as it relates to tobacco use um, in DeKalb County. We um, were part of a national campaign. What we did, I think that when you're using social media, you have to appeal to people's passions. And social media, um, especially, it's so instantaneous, it's so in your face that the messaging, you know, you have to be careful of sensory overload sometimes. And um, you want people to understand the risks of things without terrifying them. And so there's a thin line sometimes with when, when you're communicating, you don't want to sp share, spread a mass panic, but you do want to get the messaging out. I think that as far as social media, what was successful for, for us was using um, real folks that have these issues, um, particularly with smoking. We had a campaign of people that actually were smokers and, and what it did to them and their families, and it was very powerful, and we got a lot of feedback um, from the community on how, how moving it was for them to hear a child write a letter to their mother about this is what smoking has done, your smoking has done to me um, as I try to grow up. And so sometimes we, we do appeal to emotion as well as fact. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, you have mentioned that you come at this from a slightly different perspective than some uh, of our the other public health communicators. So could you share your thoughts on how you can use social media effectively in public health campaigns? Well, first of all, all the panelists right now, I've learned a lot from you guys. I mean, really some really good tips that even as a journalist, and I'm also a blogger, can, can use. But one of the things that I wanted to make sure that our audience realized is don't use medical jargon because, I mean, while the doctor you know, on our panel and our, you know, all the other medical experts, you know, if she uses some kind of medical jargon, all I know is what I've watched on ER. Okay? That's all I know. So talk to me, not at me. That's another thing. Sometimes I, 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 I read blogs or I'll go on a website and you're not talking, you know, you're, you're talking at me. You're not talking to me. You're not going to suck me in if you don't talk to me. I, I, I always tell people that I write like, um, I'm sitting right across from my mother, you know, I'm telling her a story. And sometimes, especially when I tell, talk to medical experts, I was like, okay, you got to explain this to me, talk to me. Another thing, too, is uh, just keep it simple. Just keep it simple, simple, overwhelming me with too much information. It's like sometimes I open up blogs and I see paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs. I, I don't know about you guys, but it gives me a headache. I have to turn away. And my last thing is um, do not, and I, I always tell people who are brands, bloggers, whatever, do the worst thing you can do on social media is read my blog, read my website. That doesn't suck me in. I always tell people, when you watch Entertainment Tonight, do they say, watch the next story? No, they'll say, um, who is Tom Cruise dating now? Coming up next. Think like that, because that's how we suck people in to, to and I mean it in a, in a nice way, to engage, to be involved. I think that's important. Um, and also, don't forget, use every platform. I mean, don't think just because I'm on Facebook, I'm also on Twitter. Every, and, and I think one of the other panelists addresses, every social media platform is like a different family. You're not going to, you're going to do different things with, or kind of like different girlfriends. You know, there's some girlfriends that I go out and work out with. There's some girlfriends that I go out and I have a, maybe a martini with. Every platform is different. Make sure you target that platform and that audience. And I think it'll be a win-win. I see a lot of heads nodding, so I think a lot of the panelists are in total agreement with you. Um, Pam, I want to hand it over and hear from you. I think in your work you see a lot of different campaigns, so can you talk to us about uh, using social media effectively? Yeah, I think uh, Rebecca pretty much hit the nail on the head with what she was saying. And uh, just make it personal and actionable, you know, but, but don't, I have a, a case study. I have a good friend who actually has MS and uh, she was diagnosed with this a couple years ago. And I'll tell you, she is well educated. She owns her own uh, company, very successful, you know, monetarily she's taken care of, um, but she's struggling with this terrible disease. 
and she is finding it so difficult to find credible information okay she lives on Facebook okay she's addicted it's on her mobile device 24 hours a day she does not tweet you know she does not get on LinkedIn but it's I'll tell you she should be if she's not already a target demographic for who's ever out there working on delivering MS information right and she has been inspired recently to write a blog just for the sole purpose so she can help other women you know and she was looking for some medication and looking for some different insurance um, capabilities that took her literally weeks to find because of what so many of the panelists talked about today that it's finding that credible information you know because there's so many you can go do a Google search and I'm guilty for being one that does my medical searches at night you know on my <laughs> on my mobile device saying why do I have this thing happening and you know there's so many um, blog owners blog site and website owners out there that are just trying to get clicks as we know and there's so much FUD out there and so I think that the the organizations and the leaders and the journalists that are providing medical information you have to find a way to get to this audience that needs it right and I think my friend is the perfect case study why isn't somebody on Facebook providing her that information she's there she's public she's sharing everything that she's you know that she does in life and why isn't she seeing even the right ads on Facebook that's taking her to that information and so I think it's it's just really you know if you have a campaign whatever it is and particularly medical it's something I'm passionate about my mom smoked so I can relate to what Barbara or uh, who was talking about smoking earlier was that you Patricia I think it was Dr. Ford Dr. Ford, sorry. Yeah, and so I grew up in a home with a mom that smokes, okay? So that if if that information came to me, I will never smoke because of what I how I live my life with that. I would absolutely pass on that information, right? I'd probably invite you to come onto our Get Real Chat tweet chat. Um, so you just got to to get the information out there in a compelling way and I think there's so many women journalists people that have a presence in social that are willing to, and, and ready to be your influencers right and just figure out how you can activate them within that community and um, yeah I think activating those influencers is key and I think a lot of campaigns that would be ideal is to activate the influencers to really engage a lot of people um, but campaigns are often left um, wondering whether or not they did a good job in social media did they engage the right people how can they measure success I think there's a uh, tendency to want to report the vanity metrics or the really big numbers of impressions um, because they are impressive um, the potential reach of social media but that's not necessarily necessarily the same thing as being effective and reaching your goals so my next question is how can campaigns determine whether or not they were successful using social media um, and I'd like to hand it over to Patricia to start us off well this is a, a, a really um, difficult um, thing to tackle because uh, vanity metrics, we all say, oh, don't bother, don't bother, they're not important. But there's a point at which you're such a small page that if you don't have enough likes, there's no visibility. You don't have any visibility. Because Facebook, for example, has made it, made it in such a way that if you have less than, I don't know, 1,000 likes, your page is really too small to, to give a lot of coverage. So in a way, you're working towards getting those 1,000 likes initially, and then after that, you can now start to say, okay, we are big enough now to focus on engagement metrics. So I, I hate to, to say uh, vanity metrics, uh, dismiss them all together, but unfortunately, uh, in the beginning, when you start off with social media, you kind of have to uh, get those likes in just so that Facebook can give you that visibility. But to your point, I think after you get to that uh, point where you have the, the, the size that you want, really what you're looking for is people who, people's feedback, what people are saying, how they're answering your questions, whether you, you, know, you have impacted their lives, whether you've given them solutions that help them with their problems. The kind of feedback that you're getting from your audience then becomes more important than you know vanity metrics so we have to be very careful not to completely s dismiss them because they are important up to a point 
And then thereafter, we start to see how are we impacting the people who are listening to our messages. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And I think it's important to remember, you know, vanity metrics, much to Rebecca's earlier point about using jargon, is one of the terms that we're using today in social media to talk about um, very, very large numbers that you often get from some of the monitoring services um, when you have a social media activity. So, for example, if you are using an activity in Twitter, it may calculate a potential reach for you that has a very, very large number because um, it's calculating all of your followers and your followers' followers and your followers' followers' followers. But that may not really be accurate in terms of um, what's happening uh, in that conversation and your engagement activity. Activity. Um, and so uh, I think that um, I'd like to hand it over to Rebecca to hear a little bit about metrics and engagement from your point of view as well. Honestly, I don't keep tabs on all that <laughs> vanity likes, whatever. In fact, the other day I wrote on my Facebook, I have like 450 people who ask me to like their pages. First of all, as a journalist, I want to know why. I'm tired of the clutter. I don't need clutter. And that's what, no disrespect to like pages, but. You know, I'm going to follow your credibility. I'm going to follow what you put out there. I'm going to follow, for example, what important information have you had out there that has nourished my brain, my soul, my heart? Is your like page going to do that? I don't think so. Your article will. And that's what's important. I think that some of us in social media get lost with all the likes and the, the Twitter followers and whatever. Stop. People, I mean, I talk to a lot of people all the time, not only as a journalist and as a blogger, but, for example, my group Wise Latinas linked on Facebook. We have 5,000 Latinas. They don't talk about likes and, and followers and all that. They just want to get down to the nitty-gritty. For example, yesterday, Harvard released the, the, the uh, latest survey or uh, research that, for example, if you're married, the likelihood of you surviving cancer is better because you have a, a caregiver, someone to be there to, to fight for you, to ask the tough questions. I thought immediately some of these doctors and nurses that I know would immediately tweet me, Facebook me, and say, hey, Rebecca, um, you want to talk about that? You know, you could do it locally in Dallas or whatever. Nobody did. So before you get caught up in the metrics and the likes and the vanity this and the vanity that, in my opinion, make sure you have a reporter on speed dial, social media speed dial. Make sure you have a reporter, um, you know, join me on Facebook. I have 3,000 some people, and guess what? Half of those people are reporters. Because in the end, social media is great, but traditional media is also awesome. Because traditional media will also push it on social media. And I think that's important. So I, don't, I wish I could talk to you about vanity, likes, and metrics, and all that, but honestly, I don't keep tabs on that. I just figure if people like your information, if they think you're telling them the truth, and if they think that you're going to make them healthier, they're going to follow you. You don't need to let them know, hey, like me. I don't know. That's my opinion. <laughs> Pam, I'd like to hand it over to you as well. I know that you uh, work a lot on this and some of the, mm -hmm. the things that you work on. So can you share your perspective? Sure. I think um, with metrics, this is such an interesting conversation that really we could do a three-hour Google Hangout on. But uh, really, you know, number one, it's setting those goals up front. And I think as uh, Rebecca was just talking about, it's not just about getting those Facebook likes. And I always say, you know, what, what happens after the Facebook like is actually more important. Only 98% on average of people ever go back to a Facebook page that they've actually liked. Okay, mm -hmm. so that means they're going to the only way they're going to see your content is either if that 2% that you've inspired to actually go back and visit your page, or if your information is so interesting that people are actually engaging with it and Facebook decides to put it in your fans' news feeds on Facebook because they have what they call the Facebook Edge Rank, which is an algorithm that determines that. So that's one you know, hurdle you need to get over for Facebook. Second you know, is understanding what those goals and metrics are and understanding that the quote-unquote vanity metrics and, and some things that could be Facebook likes and followers, you know, it, I always say it's a combination of both quality and quantity. You have to have an audience to listen to you Somebody has to be on that other end. But if you have the choice between having, you know, a thousand followers that are fake or that are not paying attention 
versus 100 that are listening, I'll take the 100 that are listening and that care what I have to say. And then just make sure that, that you understand that those, those vanity metrics are really what's, they're the foundational metrics. You have to be looking at some of those so you can get to the bigger goals and metrics of, of where you want to get and take your business or take your campaign. You know, and as you, you move up within an organization, um, you know, a, a, a stakeholder, somebody who is giving you funding to do these things, they're going to want to look at word of mouth. They're going to want to look at um, how is this impacting you know our our bottom line, our our strategic goals and objectives, and so uh, design, defining what those goals and objectives are up front is going to help you. And I think that's the biggest challenge that we see is that people don't know what they're measuring, right? And unless you unless it's in a plan, it's funded, and you know how to measure success, we call that a random act of marketing or social media, a Rammy, and they will eat every last morsel that you have of your ROI. And so I think there's so much time that's wasted on these vanity metrics without uh, people understanding why are they doing what they're doing. You know, at the end of the day, why are you doing your campaign? What do you want to achieve? What do you want your audience to achieve um, by engaging in your campaign and consuming the information that you're giving them? Great. Thank you. That's fantastic. And Rebecca, I see you nodding your head. Was there another thing that you wanted to add into this conversation? Uh, yes, Pam had perfect points right on the money, Pam, on everything you have said right Thanks. now. Um, one of the things too is the conversation is really not going on. You know, I'm not talk. I'm not going to talk about uh, breast exams on my Facebook page because I got a lot of men. I mean, though they wouldn't mind hearing about it. You know, we're going to go in circles. For example, uh, like I said, on Wise Latinas Link, that's where we're going to get personal. One of the things that I totally encourage uh, many brands, many healthcare providers, nurses, doctors is get yourself in one of the groups as a person, not as a doctor, not as a company. Um, I don't know how many, you know, and I won't name names, but how many uh, companies have tried to jump on Wise Latinas link? I mean, what a great place to find 5,000 Latinas. But I don't allow them in. But if you're a Latina who works at a certain company, hey, come on in. Because one, you're going to join as a Latina, and non-Latinas are, are welcome too. Um, but, you know, I'm also going to get your expertise as a nurse, as being part of a, a certain company. You have mm -hmm. to join the conversation. You have to come down to our level. And that's important. And then th that continues that, that conversation. I think that's, uh, that's key. Thank you. I totally agree that I am learning a lot from the panelists here as well. Um, it's a really fantastic group. Uh, I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about mobile. So mobile is uh, obviously something that is becoming ubiquitous. It's becoming increasingly important in uh, communications of all kinds and particularly in health. So um, I'd like to talk about the potential of mobile and health. Uh, and I'd like to start by handing it over to Patricia uh, and see what you say you have to say. Well, specifically with regards to women, um, there's a piece of research from Pew uh, Research that shows that 33% of uh, female cell phone owners look for online health information as opposed to 29% of male uh, cell phone owners. So obviously we're seeing that women are more engaged on mobile when it comes to um, health, health research. And at the same, the same research also shows that women are more likely to sign up for um, healthcare text alerts compared to men. Again, this is 2012 uh, studies, but I think we can, we can extend that to 2013 or until they give us uh, new numbers. But I think what we're saying here is that with women so engaged on mobile and social media, uh, it really, you know, you, we look at them, and I think Dr. Ford spoke to this earlier, we're caregivers, we're looking after uh, our parents, our children, our spouses, and so we want that information to help us to make these decisions. And I think that campaigns that are able to reach women on mobile, and especially through text, text, I know we have a, a whole range of apps um, that we can uh, choose from, but let's remember that text messages are more ubiquitous globally than apps. Apps are probably more um, 
used in developed countries, but if you have an audience in emerging uh, countries, poorer countries where women use uh, not smartphones but just regular cell phones, we want to think about how we can get them to sign up for those text alerts that will feed them with um, healthcare uh, messages that will benefit them and their families. Thank you. Um, I know that, Barbara, this is something that you're interested in as well. Um, do you want to add your perspective on mobile and health? Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, mobile is actually uh, a very hot topic today in terms of of in health. Um, again, according to Pew Internet and American Life Project, 60% um, of adults have downloaded an app um, to track their diet or fitness. Um, so there's so many apps out there in in the health in, in the health uh, sector today. Um, the issue with health apps, though, you have to be careful who's putting these apps out. Um, a lot of times it could be somebody just creating an app just to make money quick. So you really know, need to know the background of the company or person that has implemented this app to make sure it's a credible app that can truly help you. Um, the Mayo Clinic has apps out there. I, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, well done apps out there that can track your sleep, track can track your fitness, your pregnancy, um, but just do a little bit of research to know where the app is coming from. Um, but everybody's with their cell phones, their smartphones today. Um, it's 24-7 almost <laughs> that we have these and we're using them. But just, just do a little bit of research and make sure that you're downloading a, an appropriate app, help app. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Michelle, I want to see if you have anything uh, to add on mobile. I know this is something that you're also very interested in. Well, I think Patricia hit on the point that um, women and other users are accessing health information on their phones, and that number is only going to increase based on what we've seen so far. So that means that agencies and organizations that are providing health information really need to think away about the way their information is displayed on mobile. Um, does it render correctly? Is it searchable? Are you using Flash? Because if you're trying to get those health messages out there and you're, you're, you know, your information isn't optimized for mobile, you're going to be missing a lot of people. Great. Thank you. Our time is almost up. Um, what I really would like to hear from our panelists is what's coming, what trend should uh, we be watching for over the next year, particularly those that are going to affect uh, women and their use of social media. So um, I would like to start um, with um, Barbara and hear a little bit from you on what you think is coming up this year. Well, I think a lot of what's already happening will continue um, just on Twitter alone with the Twitter chats that are very popular, the um, breast care social media tw tw Twitter chats, the rare diseases. There's a lot of different Twitter chats that are happening. The conversations are continuing from Twitter to, to Facebook to Pinterest as well. Um, but what's, what's going to happen, I, I, a lot on healthy living, motivation, um, fitness, diets, and there's so much information out there on proper nutrition, whether it's whether you're gluten-free or you follow the Mediterranean diet. I think a lot of healthy living and to be, to be the best person that, that you can be and to be in charge of your health and to empower you to be the best person that you can be. I think a lot of healthy living topics um, will continue to rise as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, what do you think is coming? Well, my hope is that more medical experts, more brands that are in the medical field will use uh, vloggers who video blog, YouTube, Vine, Instagram. Uh, though Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn are fantastic, there's nothing like seeing the face of a doctor who's telling me about his expertise. And uh, my hope is, you know, everybody says YouTube is what, one of the top three social media platforms out there. I hope that there's more video out there because journalists like I, I mean, we love using video. We love using video in our blogs. We love using video in our stories, our TV stories. So I think that there's going to be a growth there, especially now that Instagram has a video opportunity and Vine is, hey, if you can say in six seconds, why not? Okay. 
Um, Patricia, you don't have to say it in six seconds, but tell us your thoughts in terms of what's coming ahead. Well, here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking a couple of things. Number one, the whole world hangs out on Facebook. Number two, more people are getting access to mobile phones than ever before. And number three, recently Facebook just announced that they were redefining themselves as a as a as an, a mobile economy, if you will. They're shifting gears to give users the most mobile friendly environment ever. Having said that, Facebook and mobile together. I think healthcare communicators need to look at Facebook with uh, 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 with new eyes, so to speak. Huge opportunities lie in this one platform where everybody is all around the world. And this is where, especially where women who we love to chat, and we've talked about how healthcare, uh, I'm sorry, health is personal to us, and social media is personal to us. So how do we get women talking on Facebook mm -hmm. Do we form private groups where we can talk about these things and help each other and support each other through personal healthcare journeys? So I think Facebook is where to look, but more importantly, Facebook mobile. My two cents. Uh, Michelle, I'm going to hand it over to you. Your thoughts on what's coming. I think we're going to see social media that's getting smarter. Um, for example, rather than just putting your health message out there to every audience on every tool and hoping it sticks, I think people should recognize, you know, if they're trying to reach women, they probably want to go to Pinterest, which is 74% women, and Facebook, which also has a higher per, uh, percentage of women users. I also think that um, people are going to get smarter as far as like using things like promoted tweets, like a tweet that's only going to show up at a certain time if you're in California, if you use such and such keywords rather than just shooting it all the time. Um, so I think as health communicators are going to realize how to use those strategies to reach their audience. Thank you. Uh, and Pam, I'd like to hand it over. What are your thoughts on trends and things that are coming this next year? Yeah, I think uh, second, everything all the other panelists said, but I think it's going to become more portable. And I think there's two primary shifts. I think that there's there needs to be a new focus on truly activating the influencers, you know, and tapping into what we call the OPC, the other people's communities. Because really, there are all these micro communities out there and it's it's tapping into those, figuring out who can help virally spread that message for you, and then delivering that message in the in a consumable form that people can can grab a hold of. And and mobile is huge. You know, there are one point. It's estimated by IDC that by 2015 there will be 1.3 billion mobile workers. Okay, that that statistic is compelling and should be compelling to anybody that's working in any sort of business because what that or trying to deliver any type of message because what that means that is mobile mobility and that means that you know we no longer uh, think about what device we're going to grab you know I'm going to go do some research on breast cancer or on smoking or on whatever's going on with my body or my family I'm not thinking okay I will the iPad be best to do that or will the iPhone be best to do that um, we're just gonna grab whatever device our little rug rat you know child has not confiscated um, whatever device is charged and whatever device is is, is within arm's reach and 90% of people uh, keep their mobile device within arm's reach 100% of the time. And so mobile has got to be what, you know, where we're, we're looking and what we're focusing on. And then, you know, I think to Rebecca's point too of, you know, using some different multimedia and, and, and you know, leveraging audio to bridge some of that social, some of that digital divide, um, video, images, but, you know, talking to people through audio and video, I think we're really going to see pick up. There's a lot of things coming. Uh, these are fantastic ideas and trends to watch. I consider myself somewhat knowledgeable about the space, and even I feel like trying to keep up with all the social media is like drinking from a fire hose sometimes. So now that we've discussed all the wonderful things that are going on in social media and what's coming ahead, how can people be prepared for that? I'm going to hand it back over to you, Pam, and as a follow-up, what should people do? 
So number one, don't ignore everything we just told you about mobile. Um, I think it is the biggest trend that you're going to see. And, and the brands that are going to be successful in crossing this next chasm um, with mobility are, are going to be the ones that really embrace mobile. And it's got to be mobile first. And I, I mean that wholeheartedly, that take a look at your own website or your blog. And if it makes you want to cringe and close your eyes, chances are it's doing the same thing to people that are happening upon it. And so you have got to design everything you're doing from you know the concept of, of who you're providing information for and how you're going to deliver that to them with putting mobile first. And 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 then you know just make sure that you are focused on your audience, their goals and objectives, and how you can absolutely best serve them and if you if you focus on the needs of your audience um, and providing them the best content you know we use what we call the post methodology which is people objective strategy and tactics and it's a forester research methodology but most people start with the T okay and they say okay I'm gonna go now do Instagram because that's the new best thing or I'm gonna go do you know whatever technology vine whatever's coming out back up slow down to speed up and start with the people who are they? Where are they? Where are they having a conversation? What are the objectives you, they have for themselves? What are the objectives you have for, for your brand and your business? And how can, you know, the strategy is how are you going to bring those together? And last is the technology that's going to, to help you deliver that and achieve those objectives. Thank you. I see a lot of heads nodding. Um, I really like the slow down to speed up analogy. I think that's fantastic. Um, and I today, uh, this hour was just absolutely wonderful. Some of the things that I really enjoyed um, were uh, the tips to be interesting, uh, first and foremost, to be inspiring, to be simple, to be fresh with your content, uh, to know what people want and then give it to them. It sounds very simple, but we're not always giving them what we want, know what they want and give that to them. Um, write like you're telling a story to your mother. I thought that was a fantastic example. Um, as well as use every platform, but use it in a different way. So I loved Rebecca's example of every platform um, being um, uh, like different, different girlfriends girlfriend. that you might hang out with on different occasions. That was fantastic. Um, I also love that the metrics are quantity plus quality. Sometimes you need some um, quantity in the beginning, um, but then it really does shift to more quality. Um, and another point that if people think you're telling them the truth, um, then they're going to follow you. And that doesn't matter if it means a like or a retweet or whatever it is. They're really actually engaged um, in the content. Um, to uh, that the content is only as good as uh, the extent to which people are willing to take action on it. I thought that was a great point. Uh, and a new word I learned today, Rammy, random acts of marketing. Uh, I absolutely love that and I will be using that often. Um, so in closing, I'd like to give the panelists an opportunity to um, tell us where uh, the viewers can interact with them and learn a little bit more about their work um, or follow some of the things that, that you all are working on. Um, so I would like to start with Barbara. Um, tell us where people can learn more. Sure. Um, the website is healthin30.com. I'm actually active on Twitter at and my Twitter, Twitter handle is at Barbara Ficaro. I also write on Huffington Post, which you can find me there. And I write um, for Dr. Oz as well. You can find me in his blogs over there. And, um, and then I freelance write for some other sites. Um, but those are the main. And, and I'm on Facebook, but, I, uh, but Twitter is actually probably where you can find me the most. <laughs> and, or, or the website. <laughs> Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Michelle, where can we hear more? Hi, you can find the American Public Health Association at www.apha.org, and we are very active on social media. You can follow us on Twitter. Our main account is at Public Health. But we also have very strong Facebook and LinkedIn communities. Thank you. Pam, where yeah, can we hear more? 
Yeah, so you can um, read all about Rammies on my blog at uh, pammarketingnut.com. And then our agency site is themarketingnuts with a Z.com. And then I also, I'm big into Twitter. I absolutely love Twitter. I do Facebook. Uh, we host a Tuesday night Twitter chat, Get Real Chat. Um, and you can just do a search for pound get real chat and I would love to you know continue this conversation at one point maybe on Twitter and and take some of these ladies or everybody off you know and talk about some of these subjects and um, you know and so here's there's an open book to any public sector uh, women's health organizations that want to get your information out there there are people like me who are more than willing to help you share that message and um, I think I would be happy to carry that message forward Okay, thank you. Patricia, where can we hear more about your work? Well, I think for me the best place to find me is on Twitter at P Redsicker. That's R E D S as in Sam I C K E R. And for a lot of my social media research, you can find me on socialmediaexaminer.com. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, where can we find you? I'll make it easy for you all. Just look at my name down here and Google me. <laughs> I don't think there's very many Rebecca Aguilares out there uh, on social media. So, and then Google's really good about put it, pushing up my pages. Also, um, I welcome anybody to join Wise Latinas Linked on Facebook and LinkedIn. And uh, that's about it. Thanks for this conversation. It was awesome. Yes, thank you. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Ford, where can we hear more about some of the exciting things that you're working on? Well, the Board of Health has its own Twitter handle, which is at Decab Healthy. And then I have my own, which is Dr. Ford, D C B O H, Decab County Board of Health. So. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, Donia was very pleased uh, to host and sponsor this. You can hear more uh, from Donia on our website or on our Twitter handle, which is Donia INTL. Um, I was truly inspired, definitely engaged, and I really learned a lot from this session. So thank you so much to our panelists. It was a fantastic way to spend an hour. And I'd like to say a big thank you to um, the Donia staff here who helped organize this, particularly Carlos Chapman and Heather Town who did a fantastic job and, yes, and we really look forward to continuing the conversation so thank you all for joining us and have a good thank afternoon. You. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.